Okay. Okay, we are live. We are live on YouTube. And we're up on our website. We can start. Okay, good morning, everyone. I want to thank all the district managers and the agency representatives who are here on the call this morning. Today, we're pleased to be joined by the New York City Parks Department and the Island Railroad. Uh, and of course, I'm Michael Mallon, Chief of Staff to Donovan, uh, Borough President Donovan Richards, uh, and I'm chairing uh, this uh, borough cabinet meeting in his stead. Um, as I was saying, uh, we're, we're pleased to be joined by the New York City Parks Department and the Long Island Railroad this morning. The first presentation will be from the Parks Department. Uh, for a second uh, agenda item today, will be we will receive an update from the Long Island Railroad. Um, but first, we'll begin with Parks. Uh, and without further ado, I'll hand it off to Chris Davis. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Um, I've talked to many of you at uh, the annual community board uh, con uh, budget consultations. Uh, I'm Chris Davis. I'm the chief of recreation for Queens. Uh, my team operates the recreation centers in Queens, uh, the indoor pools and field house programs in the borough. We also lead a variety of seasonal programs and events throughout the borough. I'm going to be present presenting on some of our ongoing and upcoming, upcoming programs and events. I'll also be talking about some of the job opportunities. Sorry, one second. I was talking about some of the job opportunities that are available within parks this summer, and then wrapping up with an overview of our special event permit process. Um, are you able to see the screen? I tried to share the screen here. Everyone able to see it? All right, thanks. Uh, some of the ongoing programs, um, well, two of the programs I want to highlight are Saturday Night Lights and our Citywide Aquatics programs. Um, our Saturday Night Lights program is continuing at three locations, Sorrentino Recreation Center, Roy Wilkins, and Al Order. We also have extended morning, evening, and weekend hours at all three of these sites. Uh, we're getting more than 200 teens at Al Order uh, most Saturday nights. We're offering a variety of sports, uh, including basketball and volleyball, which have been our most popular activities but we're supplementing the sports activities with arts and crafts, uh, board games, computer room access, and, and more. Uh, we've had great representation from our local precincts each week. And at Al Order, the Mets recently held a forum uh, which discussed job opportunities and career paths uh, in their organization. So we had a really nice turnout for that. Um, and the Mets did some nice giveaways uh, and some other activities with the kids. Uh, with our aquatics programs, we're running aquatics programs at Roy Wilkins Recreation Center and the Flushing Meadows Aquatic Center. Thank you for everyone that came out to the opening of the aquatic center. Um, our programs there include learn to swim programs, which includes Swim for Life, which is a program for second graders um, in partnership with the Department of Education. We have swim teams at both locations and we're running water exercise classes aimed at adults and at seniors. Uh, our citywide aquatics team has been piloting new classes meant to prep high school students for opportunities of li as lifeguards or as aquatic specialists. Uh, we're hoping this program will, will funnel kids into our lifeguard training program. Um, the new aquatics learn to swim session just started this week and it runs through June 24th. Um, and then both buildings are also open seven days a week and they have time in the pool dedicated to lap swim and, and family swim. This is a picture of one of our water aerobics classes at Roy Wilkins. Uh, as far as upcoming programs, uh, one of the most important ones we have coming up is our senior games. Uh, NYC Parks annual senior games uh, is gonna be taking place June 5th through 17th. Uh, this is the first year we're doing this since we shut down for COVID, right? So we were doing it annually up until 2019. Uh, this program is a great opportunity for our seniors to compete and to stay active. Uh, the games have traditionally taken place in Brooklyn, but we've had great representation from our members at Roy Wilkins, Al Order, and Lost Battalion Hall. In the last games in 2019, our Roy Wilkins team medaled in swimming, track and field, pickleball, bowling, and board games. Um, 
in the in the months leading up to the actual senior games, we're going to be running clinics at all of our recreation centers in Queens. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting small events, uh, you know, set to prep the uh, seniors for the actual competition. Um, while the games have traditionally taken place in Brooklyn, we're going to be hosting the swimming competition in the Flushing Meadows Aquatic Center this year. And again, the event will take place June 5th uh, through 17th, June the 17th. We also have our Kids in Motion program starting on April 15th. Uh, the Kids in Motion program engages children in active outdoor play, including organized sports, games, fitness, uh, board games, water games, and, and a lot more. Um, our staff is there to lead activities uh, five days a week. They're there to provide an adult presence in the park, and they're there to help keep their park clean and safe. When we're fully staffed on July 21st, we should have 22 Kids in Motion sites open, and we'll have at least one site open in every district. Uh, we also have our summer camp coming up. Uh, we host summer day camp in six locations in Queens. Uh, Sorrentino Recreation Center, Detective Keith Williams Fieldhouse, uh, Arrow and Astoria, Al Order, Casino Park, and Cunningham Park. The lottery for registration took place in March, and currently all spots are filled, but some spots may open up later as soon as students find out about summer school assignments or other uh, school opportunities. And parents can stay informed by checking the summer camp page of our website or signing up for updates on the website. Um, our Playmobiles um, are, st are still available uh, for, for uh, request. So the Playmobiles are available right by request from May through October. And it's for events that are free and open to the public. This com includes community festivals, health fairs, uh, free programs, and other related events. We've done lots of things with the community boards and with elected officials. Uh, we also do some school events. We don't do private or exclusive events or, or uh, private parties or other uh, programs associated with a fee. So our mobile units are stocked with games, balls, other sports activities, arts and crafts, and more activities. Um, the online portal to request the mobile unit is not currently active, uh, but units can be requested for Queens events by calling my office at 718-393-7370. Uh, uh, people can also email me directly uh, hopefully they'll have information online soon about how to uh, how to apply. But for now, people can reach out directly to my office or to me. Um, as far as events, this spring we'll be hosting family days and other festivals in several districts in conjunction with council members. We're planning events with James Gennaro, uh, Tiffany Caban, Natasha Williams, Bob Holden. Adrian Adams. We're doing some fitness activities with Council Member Moya. Um, and then we'll also have movies under the, star, under the stars scheduled with all Queens Council members between now and July 15th. Uh, two special events that we have uh, coming to us uh, are the Public Theater's mobile unit, which will be performing Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors at two of our locations. Pre-COVID, we hosted these uh, shows in our gyms and in our field houses. But uh, right now they're doing outdoor shows. So we'll have a show at Roy Wilkins Park on May 4th. And then um, in the courtyard at Arrow, we'll have shows on uh, May 17th and May 19th. We also partner with the uh, Jazz Foundation of America. So we're planning several outdoor shows with them. Our first show will be at Roy Wilkins Park on May 25th. The feature performer there is gonna be drummer Craig Holiday Haynes. Uh, we're also looking to do uh, at least one concert in um, Lawrence Virgilio Park and in uh, Bound Park. So we're still hiring for um, all of our summer programs, which includes Kids in Motion, our summer camp, Movies Under the Stars, and our mobile units. So our main summer title is Playground Associate, and, and we often hire college students uh, for, this, for this position as you need to have some college credits or a high school diploma and past recreation experience. Uh, we're also hiring CSAs as city seasonal aides. Um, and these can be people with less experience and they can be high school students. So it's a nice opportunity for high school students to get, get a start with us um, working in summer camp or other programs. Uh, we also utilize dozens of summer youth staff in our programs and buildings. These are indirect hires though. We don't hire them directly. They come through our, the approved providers for SYEP. 
is also a host of year-round opportunities in recreation and parks in general. Two positions that are currently open um, to everyone are borough sports supervisor and center manager. So these are center managers that are going to be working in, in our buildings uh, citywide, but these positions haven't traditionally been open, um, open to all. They've usually only been open to uh, current parks employees. So this is our website. Um, you can find information about jobs under opportunities. I, do, I would encourage people to go look, look under opportunities. Uh, once you click on opportunities, you'll click on career opportunities. And the Jobs at Parks page will open up. There's seasonal positions in maintenance, security, uh, recreation, administration, and internships in many divisions, and, and plenty of uh, year-round um, permanent positions as well. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the permit process with a focus uh, on special events permits. That's, you know, most of the inquiries we get are about special events permits. So I will um, focus mainly on that. Uh, to access our permit, permit system on the website, you're going to click on the permits tab. And this window will open up here. And you'll see we're, we're doing a, a variety of, per, of permits, uh, special events permits and tennis permits, field and court permits. Those are the basic ones for the public, but there's also stuff for boating and marinas and farmers markets and other stuff. Uh, and then there's information, permit rules and fee schedules can be found there. For our special events, uh, you can apply online and we recommend applying online. It's easier to follow it through the system. You can still apply in person here at the office in uh, Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, there's a 21 to 30 day processing period. We often get stuff uh, and a much shorter turnaround than that, uh, but it can be tricky. We do try to work with people and get their permit through the system. I mean, that's our goal is to actually uh, issue permits. Um, so we will work with people if they get it uh, in late, uh, but we do uh, ask that it's a 21 to 30 day processing period. There's a $25 processing fee, but there are, fa are fee waivers for city agencies, uh, for elected officials, and for our registered friends of parks groups. Our large and sponsored events uh, are handled by our citywide special events office. So if we get an application for an event over 500 people, or if there's sponsorship involved, a lot of our basketball tournaments have sponsorship involved, uh, or if they're ticketed events, we'll engage our citywide special events office and they'll manage those permits through the system. Uh, the approvals of permits are done by the park managers. Uh, so that's, you know, those are the people on the ground. They know what's happening in the parks. They know what the space is available. They know how the parks are being used. Um, so they may suggest other locations for people that are applying for events. You know, our goal is to permit as many of these events as possible, but we also wanna make sure that the um, parks are still usable for all. Uh, there are some prohibited items at private events. Um, we, we don't often approve large DJ setups unless it's part of a, a larger sponsored event. Uh, again, we, we want these parks to be usable for all when people bring in extra large DJ equipment, um, it pretty much taking over that whole park for the day um, in many ways. Uh, we don't allow inflatable items. We do do some inflatables with elected officials. We do some inflatables with PD events, uh, but we don't allow inflatable items like bounce houses for private events. And then some parks may have blackout dates or times for sound permits. Uh, you know, there's some communities where we, you know, people live right, a, right over a park and while we do do some sound permits at those sites, we don't want every weekend taken over with um, you know, heavy sound. Uh, I'll talk quickly about sports field permits. Um, these permits are issued seasonally. Uh, we have a spring and summer season that's done uh, together. Then we have a fall season and a winter season. And, and use, of the, uh, use of the ball field is based on availability, which can be tight at times. Um, we definitely have a shortage of usable soccer fields. Um, usable full-size soccer fields in the borough. Um, and then youth, and program, youth programs and schools get a priority on those permits. Uh, our new director of special events is Michelle Young. I put her phone number here. It's the same, no, that office number hasn't changed, uh, but Michelle Young is now uh, in charge of that office. It had been Susan Friedman for many years. Um, and this is Michelle's uh, email address. All right. Thank you, everyone. That's all I have uh, for my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, yes, at this time, we'll take questions. No questions. Looks like they're letting you off easy today, Chris. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Gary, Gary has a question. Oh, okay, Gary, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, mo mostly a compliment. I think that these programs are often just really wonderful for, for the young people and whoever else they're being provided for. So I wanna thank the Parks Department um, as well as all the youth organizations in the borough for making summer a lot more fun um, for uh, a lot of young people. Here, here. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Florence followed by Marie. And actually piggyback on Gary, Parks does a wonderful job. Uh, post pandemic, are we gonna get all of our summer programs back, the tennis, the golf for the youth, all of that in the park? And with Astoria Park being closed, the pool is gonna be under renovation for that portion of the park. I don't see enough uh, social media letting from Parks Department, letting the public know that the alternate would be, please try to use Flushing Meadow Park or um, the other park pool that was noted. Could Parks Department please bless that a little more? Thanks, I could pass like the, the social media messaging I'll pass on to uh, Parks Operations. Um, you know, as far as, as far as programming, um, City Parks Foundation does a lot of those tennis programs and track and field. And they, they have said that they're going to be at full capacity this year. Thank you. Good morning, Marie. Good morning. Thank you so much for this good information. I hope you were able to send us flyers so we can put out in our newsletters to encourage people to participate. Um, on a noted note, I was hoping we would have someone from the um, forestry part of um, the Parks Department. And I hope that someone comes back because we do have a lot of forestry issues that we'd like to have addressed. Certainly, and I'll take that. We can certainly bring forestry on. Okay, any last questions before we move on? Okay, seeing none, I wanna thank uh, Chris and Parks for, for being here. Uh, thank you very much for your great work. Uh, so moving on, our second agenda item for today, uh, we'll receive an update from the Long Island Railroad. We're representing the LIRR is Annabel uh, Frias. Annabel serves as the Assistant Director of Government and Community Relations. Annabel will be discussing the ADA project at Four Queens locations. In addition to the ADA project, she will also discuss the new time schedule and adjustments that were made after the first week. Uh, and uh, without further ado, Annabel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. My name is Annabelle Frias. Um, good morning. Um, so I am an assistant director of government and community relations at the Long Island Railroad. If you would give me a second, I'm just going to share my presentation and I'll get started. Let's see here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Please let me know if you cannot. And I yes. Perfect. Okay, so as Michael mentioned, I am here to provide updates on our ADA project, as well as our new service plan that we implemented on February 27th. So I will start with our ADA stations improvement project. In December, we awarded a contract to make seven stations ADA compliant and replace elevators at two additional stations for a total of nine stations. Four of those stations in this project are in Queens. So I'm gonna go over each um, station and the individual scope for, for each station. Um, so at St. Albans, we will be installing an elevator near the center of the platform within an existing pedestrian tunnel. And that'll be connecting the street level with the platform level. We will also be reconstructing the tunnel to provide the required um, height clearances. Other ADA improvements at the station include improvement to the ADA path travel and ADA improvements in the parking lot. At Locust Manor, um, since there are two platforms at that station, we will be installing two elevators to serve those two platforms, 
as well as improving the ADA path of travel and installing information kiosk. At Laurelton, we will be installing a new elevator by ex excavating and constructing a tunnel to accommodate the elevator shaft. And then in Auburndale, that's one of the stations where we will be replacing the elevator and it will just be within its current configuration, just a new elevator shaft. In terms of a schedule, um, the contractor will actually be beginning work at four stations in Long Island um, sometime this summer and then they'll work their way west um, into the Queen Station. Um, we are awaiting a finalized schedule for the Queen Station, um, but work should begin sometime in 2024. Uh, the contractor is actually currently at Locust Manor um, doing some soil boring surveying there. Um, so they're, they're moving along. And then the following couple of slides are just renderings of the project. So. Here's a rendering of the St. Albans station and um, an idea of what the um, ADA project will look like once completed. As you can see here, the elevator shaft will be through that tunnel and it will go up towards the platform level. And then towards your right, you see a bit of a structure that would be that will be the communication room for the elevator. Here is a rendering of the Locust Manor ADA project. As you can see, there are two elevators um, serving both platforms. Uh, I apologize, this bar is covering a bit of what I wanted to show, but um, underneath is the improved ADA path of travel. Here is a rendering of the Laurelton station. Um, and as you can see, we'll be excavating um, a tunnel um, and installing the elevator shaft there, and that will go up towards the center of the platform. And it's not included in the rendering here, but um, at the, there will be a curve to accommodate any ADA path travel as well. Um, and the communication rooms are just these two structures uh, attached. And then at Auburndale, as I mentioned, will be it's just replacing the current elevator um, and it'll be in the current configuration. So. Um, not much will change there. It's just a new um, elevator and um, some aesthetic changes. So that is it for the ADA portion of this presentation. Um, I'm going to move along to talk about our service plan. As I mentioned earlier, we uh, implemented our new service plan on February 27th. This is the biggest service increase in Long Island Railroad history. We added 271 Long Island Railroad trains per day, increasing system-wide service to 936 trains per day. Service levels increased to 41% uh, over the previous schedule, schedule of 665 daily trains and created reverse peak service on the Port, Port Jefferson and Ron Concoma branches for the first time. All of this being said, we do acknowledge that we definitely had a rough start to this new service. And we know that our customers um, were inconvenienced and did struggle that first week, especially, but even on to the second week, especially our Brooklyn right, um, Brooklyn bound riders. Um, so we just want to acknowledge that and mention that we've been adapting to address these concerns from the public as quickly as possible. So since then, we have made some adjustments based on some of the major issues that we have seen and heard from commuters. So one major issue we heard um, were regarding the levels of service for the Atlantic terminal shuttles. We heard complaints about the Brooklyn service being every 12 minutes. Um, so we increased frequency to be between every eight to nine minutes by adding more trains to accommodate that issue. Another issue was the track assignment changing day to day. We heard complaints about that requiring excessive up and over um, loops for our customers. So what we did is we rationalized which trains use which tracks in Jamaica. And we also encouraged commuters to transfer east of Jamaica if possible, such as transfers at Mineola, Brentwood and Wonton for a less crowded commute. And I also wanted to mention that at Jamaica, we um, have dedicated tracks one, two, and three to uh, accommodate trains going to Penn Station and Grand Central. 
And that has also helped with, um, with that particular issue. And another major issue we heard was the overcrowding on Penn, um, Penn Station trains. What we did is we reallocated trains and we lengthened train sets to accommodate the capacity to better reflect the 70-30 passenger split that we saw. About 70% of our passengers are going to Penn Station and 30% are going to Grand Central. So we accommodated by lengthening Penn Station trains uh, a bit more and reallocating some trains um, from Grand Central to Penn Station. And of course, we are continuing onboard announcements, utilizing our screens in our, in our cars. And we are also encouraging our commuters to use all available seats. We do know that uh, occasionally our commuters don't prefer sitting in um, those middle seats, um, but we do find that that does help with overcrowding. So if possible, please use all available seats on the trains. And then I wanna talk a bit more about the Brooklyn service. So rush hour service was increased to Brooklyn by adding two additional train sets, reducing time between trains on the Jamaica Brooklyn shuttle. Now there are a total of nine train sets operating between Jamaica and Atlantic Terminal. That's an increase of about 29% over the first week and effectively is reducing wait times for Brooklyn customers during both peak periods. Additionally, to streamline, tra streamline transfers to Brooklyn, the Long Island Railroad has platform controllers to assist customers on platform F, which serves tracks 11 and 12, um, where our Brooklyn trains are departing from. The platform controllers determine the timing of train departures and they can hold connections when appropriate. When conditions allow, a Brooklyn service does not depart the platform within the arrival of a second train, without the arrival of a second train on the opposite track for the morning rush hour. So that way there's always a train um, awaiting customers on tracks 11 or 12. Similarly, we have uh, uh, the same system at Atlantic Terminal in the afternoon and evening rush. So that concludes my presentation for today. I do have my contact information one more time for those who were not able to catch it. Um, and I also wanted to answer a couple of questions that I received from um, community boards specifically. Um, so I'll, I'll leave this up for anybody who would like to um, write that down while I'm answering these questions. So from Community Board 7, um, we heard complaints about vendors under the trestle, um, as well as squatter sleeping and urinating in elevators. Um, so specifically regarding the urination elevators and squatter sleeping, I will be relaying those issues to the our MTAPD and the branch line manager to address those issues. Um, regarding the vendors under the trestle, um, so, of course, we do not allow vendors underneath our trestles. Um, I'll be relaying that information as well. Um, but I, I believe that this is an issue uh, that it's been multifaceted and requires a couple different agencies um, to, to address this issue. It's, it, it seems like they're not just underneath our trestle. They could be up on our trestle and also on um, city property. Um, so I did want to mention that, um, but we will be addressing what we can on our property. Um, a second question I received from Community Board 7 was regarding trash at stations and who is responsible for picking up trash at, at stations, specifically at Murray Hill Station. Um, so we are responsible for maintaining um, our properties, uh, picking up trash at our station. Um, so that would be either our platforms, station buildings right away. Um, so we are responsible for maintaining those locations and we do. Um, Regardless, there are instances where either one of our cleaners might have overlooked something or they got there in the morning and then an incident happened in the afternoon and they weren't able to address it. So um, we do understand that I am relaying to the branch line manager at uh, Murray Hill, specifically that Community Board 7 would like um, us to um, at least go take a site visit there and, and see what's going on. So if there's anything that we can address there, we will do so. Another question I receive is, or request, I should say, um, is regarding our trestle on Archer and Geyer Brewer um, requesting bird netting to decrease bird droppings. So I did put in this request, um, but I did want to clarify. So 
we can install netting in the walkway um, under the trestle. Uh, we no longer install netting on the road, over the road. And the reason for that is because we have found that when we do that and there's a large truck that drives um, through, occasionally they hit that netting and that netting then is dislocated and falls um, and obstructs traffic. So for safety reasons, we don't install netting over the roadways any longer. Um, but we can install netting um, over the walkways if, if there are major issues with bird droppings. So I have put in that request and I can follow up once I have more information there. Um, another question was regarding traffic issues uh, at that trestle. Um, parked cars apparently. So I've relayed that to MTAPD. Um, I haven't heard back just yet regarding uh, parked cars um, and how they're going to be resolving that issue, but I'll follow up with them today um, and I can get back to you on that. Um, and then I have a request for replacements of lights at Subton Boulevard Station, um, which is completely dark. I believe that's a DOT request. Um, I can relay, relay that to the DOT um, liaison. I'm not sure if they're on, but I can also get in contact with them afterwards. Um, and another request for the Jamaica station um, to be cleaned, very much understood. We have received this particular um, complaint from others. So that request has been relayed to the branch line managers. There are cleaners there every day and multiple times a day. Um, but if there is a particular issue or a specific issue um, that anyone has, please let me know and I can relay exactly any issues that, that you've seen to our branch line manager so they can pay special attention to it. And then the final question that I have is regarding the city ticket program for the far Rockaway station. So I know that this has been um, an ongoing discussion for some time now. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any more information to share regarding the city ticket program expanding for um, Far Rockaway commuters at that particular station. Um, as you may know, it, it is a bit of a, um, a complicated question at the moment, but I know that there have been discussions that are ongoing. Um, there just isn't an update just yet. Um, so I would say stay tuned. I will provide any update that I have once I hear um, of any changes. So that is it for my presentation. and. Of course, I am here for any further questions. Thank you very much, Annabelle. I do see one. Uh, Marilyn, good morning. You're on mute. Again, I'll repeat myself. I'm sorry. Annabelle, great presentation. Uh, I'm Marilyn McAndrews from Board 7 who gave you all your questions and would like very much to invite you or our staff members to join uh, Ido Chagall, who is on from the mayor's office, also on this line, to perhaps do a walkthrough on uh, Main Street Flushing. And you are correct. In addition to people loitering and vendors under the trestle, there are uh, a myriad of uh, vendors all over the place. So I will be contacting you in regards to setting up an appointment, if that's okay with you. Of course, of course. Great to meet you as well. But yes, we are more than happy to do a walk through there. Just let us know when. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. We'll be in contact. Thank you. Our next, Gary Giordano. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for being here. My, I have two concerns that are a little bit um, uh, more far reaching. One of them is that we have uh, the LIRR freight rail operation in our community board, and it passes through others, but New York and Atlantic Railway is the vendor for the freight rail line, um, and all of that freight comes has to come into Glendale to be sorted. For years, we've been looking for new locomotives for um, the freight rail line. And there is, if you can believe this, there's $20 million set aside by the state legislature to enable uh, the Long Island Railroad to buy uh, either 
20 new locom I'm sorry, $20 million worth of locomotives. So that would be at least eight new locomotives, I believe, or to, you know, to retrofit the existing ones. And I didn't want to bring this up because I figured others had more local issues, but this affects a lot of different neighborhoods in Queens <clears throat> because we're looking for less polluting locomotives. The ones that the uh, New York and Atlantic Railway leases from the LIRR are circa 1970 locomotives. And the money is there. So I would ask you if you could please find out if there is an RFP out uh, to award a contract for either lo new locomotives for the freight rail line, which is polluting the neighborhood and other neighborhoods uh, with these old locomotives, or money to retrofit the existing locomotives with new, uh, new engines and, uh, and uh, pollution reducing equipment. Of course, of course. And great to meet you, Gary. I can definitely find that out. Um, and I, I know that this has also been a long uh, ongoing issue for, for many years. Um, I'm sure you know Hector Garcia from the Long Island Railroad. Um, so he has mentioned this to me. I'll ask him if there's any sort of RFP that is currently out or um, in the works um, or even a, dis a discussion. Um, so I will get back to you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, good morning, Ivan Reddick. Um, now, oh, you're muted, Yvonne. Yvonne, you're still muted. You're, you're, now you're fine. Okay, thank you and good morning. I had submitted those uh, questions regarding Septon Boulevard and the Archer. I questioned regarding the lighting. I was told they that's the Long Island Railroad. Yeah, that is, it, it is not from my understanding that is on um, DLT um, responsibility. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from DLT on, but um, I did put in the request initially and that, that was the response that I received, but that is, uh, yes. And I, I can relay that information to the DLT as well. Let me know that CB12 specifically acts for replacements of lighting there. I do know that it's dark. I do pass by there. Yes, uh, it is. It's dark. Very, very valid concern there. So I can definitely um, speak to our DLT liaison as well and then um, let them know of this request. Um, the guy brought the dropping. Mm -hmm. yes. It's bad, extremely bad. I'm actually going today, I'm going to drive there and take some photos. I'm going to send in the request with the photos so that they see it. Um, and as I mentioned, we can do bird dropping um, over the walkways, but for safety reasons, we are no longer doing um, netting over the roadways. Um, but hopefully netting over the walkways will alleviate that issue. Um, I think I know, I'm pretty sure I know where the particular issue is. There's some yeah there and the birds like to rest in that and area. it's also the bus stop mm, at the bus stops as well the bus stop all right i'll note that but i'm, I'm going today i'll take some photos and I'll, I'll put in that request okay good thank you hey uh gary is your hand up from earlier or do you have an additional question oh no i'm sorry not a problem are there any other additional questions? Okay, seeing none, I wanna thank Annabelle for uh, your presentation. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for attending today's borough cabinet. Uh, and lastly, I wanna thank the QBPO staff for putting this all together. I hope to see everyone at the State of the Borough Address at Queens Theater on Friday, April 28th. If you haven't already RSVP'd, please do so. Uh, and if you need additional information, my colleagues Maricel and Khalil can get that to you. Uh, our next ca borough cabinet meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 2nd at 9.30 a.m. Have a great day, everyone, and, uh, and thank you for being here once again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.